Good afternoon. A very warm welcome. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm Director of the Institute for Government, and I'm delighted to welcome you to what is the last event, apart from the Summer Party, in our 10-year anniversary celebrations. Um, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Uh, we've had a tremendous three days of discussion here, really about all kinds of aspects of our work, and delighted to have brought together many people internationally from many public services, from the civil service here, many politicians, many academics and researchers to talk about how to uh, rise to the challenges of running a modern government. And so we're delighted to have here Sir Mark Sedwell, the Cabinet Secretary, to talk uh, in the final part of the, the formal program, if you like, before we all break to go downstairs, to talk about the challenges of the public service in a modern democracy in the 21st century. And we're particularly delighted that Sir Mark has come at what you might call excessively interesting times um, and come to talk about these thoughts. We've been delighted to work with him in the, in, um, since he uh, took the post about the many ideas he has about not just the structures of the civil service but how a modern civil service might organize its thinking. And indeed, I think the word fusion is going to come up. Um, Sir Mark, we're delighted to have you here. And I think you're going to speak to us Great. briefly. I will ask some questions. I know there's going to be a lot of questions from you. Thank you, Sir Mark. Welcome. Well, Bromley, thank you uh, very much, and um, thank you all for being here. Um, I will. I realise it's I'm keep, the one keeping you from the uh, notorious um, IFG summer party, which I've enjoyed myself uh, on occasion, and will certainly enjoy after this, uh, before I see any uh, stories about it. Um, uh, and I hope, therefore, to keep you entertained for the next, uh, the next short period before you go downstairs and finish this event. It's a great honour to be asked to conclude this conference. Uh, I was here uh, at a dinner just a couple of nights ago, which David Sainsbury, Lord Sainsbury, uh, the chairman of the uh, Institute, hosted to mark the 10th anniversary uh, of the IFG. Uh, and I've, I and my predecessors have worked uh, with uh, this uh, Institute over the, uh, the 10 years. Uh, and will continue to do so. They provide a, a, a tremendous uh, service and insight to us in government. But I know I'm very pleased to see uh, uh, Emily Thornbury and other uh, politicians here. We know that they've, all, they've provided over the years um, much uh, uh, guidance to opposition politicians as well um, uh, uh, in uh, thinking about how, uh, what their own views are uh, on government. And I know, Bronwyn, you'll continue to provide that service to the whole political and public service uh, system. It's also next week the anniversary of my taking uh, the chair as Cabinet Secretary. Of, uh, uh, of course, I was only finally appointed after the sad death of my predecessor, Jeremy Hayward, but I took over uh, around uh, a year ago, and it has indeed been quite a, uh, year, uh, quite a year since. But I think I'll leave my reflections on that uh, for perhaps another time and Chatham House rules uh, 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 on a different occasion. It's... Um, as Cabinet Secretary, I'm also uh, Head of the Civil Service, and that's an enormous privilege. I was just at a, an event uh, which we hold from time to time. Senior civil servants here will be familiar with it, which we, is nicknamed the Top 200. It's essentially uh, Directors General and senior civil servants from across the entire civil service. But I think for the first time we brought together uh, some, uh, uh, some representatives of the wider public service, and indeed... I think will be, that event will become the top 300 or something of that kind in the past. So we had chief constables, uh, we had public service leaders from local government, uh, and I'm very conscious that as head of the civil service, uh, sitting here in Whitehall, we sit not only at the head of the civil service, but at the heart uh, of the public service. We often talk about the 400,000 civil servants. Dave Penman, uh, nice to see you here, uh, one of the uh, representatives of the, of the employee organisations. Uh, but, of course, we also... Uh, are, are part of a wider public service of five million public servants uh, across uh, this country who get up every day uh, to look after uh, the interests of their uh, fellow citizens. And I'm very proud to be one of the people who's able to represent uh, that, wider, uh, that wider set of professionals, professional public servants uh, in our uh, public uh, life. I'm very proud of what they've, uh, they've delivered. Uh, not only in the past year, but uh, in many years before. Of course, here in Whitehall, uh, Brexit has been a dominant theme, and uh, uh, there are several thousand civil servants working on that, preparing for whatever outcome uh, happens, whatever the nature of the uh, transition. But most of those 400,000, like the rest of the 5 million, are providing 
services to our individual citizens. And those, the nature of those services, as we bring new technology to bear, uh, is changing. The nature of the roles is changing. And more and more uh, civil servants who are providing those services, including to some of our most vulnerable citizens, people with complex needs, will be relying more on their empathy, more on their emotional intelligence, more on their connection to people uh, than uh, on the kind of processing jobs that they have done, uh, many of them, in the past. So I'm just going to get myself a glass of uh, water. Um, the other thing that I'm very proud of is the levels of public trust. If you look at levels of public trust in uh, uh, public servants generally, uh, they're high. The civil service itself, the latest Ipsos Mori uh, poll, puts uh, trust in the civil service at 62%. That's the highest it's ever been. I will, uh, won't go through all of the list because there are journalists and politicians present. Um, but um, but that, is a pretty good, uh, that is a pretty good track record. If there's a soundbite out of this uh, session, if it's that one, I guess I'll probably just about get away with it. Um, but uh, Bromwell said I should talk about the challenges that we're going to face both as a country but as a public service ahead, and then how do we adapt our public service to it. And I think there are a few I would just like to touch upon, and uh, some of you have uh, uh, been in audiences I've spoken to before, so uh, please don't all look at your phones at this point. You might have heard some of this before. Uh, but I'd like to touch on really three big ones. First is the shift in the global order. We're seeing uh, extraordinary change uh, in the world with China, Inda, India, Indonesia, um, the rise of uh, uh, extraordinary economic progress in countries, particularly in Asia, and that is changing uh, the nature of international relationships. And of course, the relationship between Beijing and Washington is absolutely critical to uh, the world economy, to global security, uh, and indeed to uh, many of the big environmental challenges uh, that we face. Second, uh, all countries are going to be facing uh, the challenge of the fourth industrial revolution, a whole range of transformational technologies essentially coming together over the next uh, decade. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomous uh, 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 technology, synthetic uh, biology, big data, and so on. Uh, and uh, these uh, changes coming together over the next decade will probably have more profound effects uh, on our economies and societies uh, than uh, certainly any uh, similar uh, uh, um, uh, technological change uh, in our lifetimes and arguably for uh, longer than that. Now, the UK is in good shape to benefit with that. We've just had a very successful uh, London Tech Week. But it is clear the countries that adapt well to that will prosper and those that don't uh, will fall behind. And, of course, like many countries, uh, in fact, every country outside sub-Saharan Africa, there are big demographic challenges um, for uh, the UK uh, and others with an ageing society, changing dependency ratios and so on. And uh, governments of all kinds, governments of any complexion in this country and abroad will be wrestling with these challenges and trying to identify the opportunities and bring their own priorities and values to them uh, over the next uh, decade. And our job as the civil service and our job as the public service is to be able to help those governments navigate those challenges, exploit the opportunities and achieve the goals that they set um, as they come uh, as they come to power. And of course for the UK, uh, then we, we have to navigate our way through the Brexit transition and make a success um, of uh, the settlement that we achieve uh, after that. And that will require a reorientation uh, as well. When, I look at, uh, when we look at uh, government priorities and commitments, um, it is striking how wide they range. There are, um, and this is I think typical of most governments, there are over 600 um, that, uh, uh, political commitments that this uh, government has from manifestos and, and so on. Um, over half of those relate to uh, uh, social inclusion and well-being, about a quarter relate to prosperity and growth, and about a fifth to sustainability, to security and to international affairs. Now of course not all commitments are equal, but it is striking just, um, uh, just uh, uh, how that distribution works. And of course again different governments will have different uh, priorities um, and part of what the civil service has to be able to do is be ready for governments of whatever uh, configuration as they think about how do they want to prioritize different issues across the well-being of the citizen, the inclusion uh, of society, the prosperity of the country as a whole, and the inclusiveness uh, of growth, national security, public safety, uh, uh, sustainability, and our international uh, influence. Um, what I'm struck by, and we talk uh, a lot about this now in the civil service, is that the kind of commitments that governments make and put in their manifestos are not the way we organize ourselves. We tend to think of departments, programs, 
um, individual uh, approaches. I can't think of a single political manifesto that says we're going to ask Department X to, to deliver program Y. That isn't the way you win elections. It certainly isn't the way that people communicate uh, with the citizens and voters. And so we have to adapt Whitehall, but the wider civil and public service, to deliver not just the commitments that governments make uh, in the contract, essentially, they, they um, make with the citizen as they, uh, uh, as they uh, are elected, but to organize ourselves to support them uh, to d deliver those commitments in a way that is relevant to the citizen and uses the language that ministers and uh, citizens themselves uh, would use. Now, of course, we have to have all the disciplines of proper programs um, uh, and uh, departmental structures, but we need to remember that is the way that we organize ourselves, not the way that the citizen uh, experiences our services and their interaction with state, nor is it the way that um, uh, ministers, uh, political parties will express the commitments and priorities uh, that they want to make. And we have to have a decent gearing mechanism between the two. Have we? Oh, yeah, okay, you have. Do you want? No, you have. Can, can, you, can you manage, otherwise I'll get you another one. Candace. Now, I think, in general, um, the British Civil Service is in good shape to meet uh, those challenges and help governments meet those challenges. Uh, if you look at the Index of International Civil Service Effectiveness, INSIZE, which was published uh, recently, um, I'm absolutely delighted the UK came top uh, overall. Uh, and that's a great credit to the hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of public servants up and down uh, the country. But of course, that's a broad index, and while we might be the gold medalist decathlete, if you like, um, there are different elements of that where other countries uh, do better than us and where we can learn. So we are in the top handful of countries for policy formulation, for regulation, for tax administration, for fiscal and financial management, uh, for procurement uh, and uh, for openness. But other countries, and of course the people responsible for these things always say the measures aren't quite right, but other countries do better than us uh, at digital, um, uh, at some other capabilities and uh, at uh, institutional uh, culture. Canada and Sweden are particularly strong uh, at the latter. Uh, the Baltic nations and Singapore are particularly strong uh, at uh, the former. We've also made a big priority, and my predecessor, Jeremy Hayward, made a big priority of uh, the diversity and inclusion agenda within the civil service, trying to ensure that we are truly representative as an institution of the country and citizens uh, that we serve. And it is important that it's both parts of that. In many, in many ways, as we've made progress on diversity, and we have now, uh, there's always further to go, but we now have uh, more women, more ethnic minorities, more people who, reg who are registered disabled throughout the civil service, including in leadership positions than we've ever had uh, before. Uh, but as I say, we're never satisfied with that. There's further to go. But as we look at um, our institutional culture and how other countries uh, uh, similar to ours do this particularly well, in a way, we need to think about not diversity and inclusion, but inclusion and diversity, because it is that inclusive culture uh, that is going to attract the kind of people, whatever their background, um, that we need, and not only attract them, but retain them and motivate them um, through their careers uh, in uh, the civil service. It's very striking when I talk to young audiences of people thinking about a public service career and thinking about joining the civil service, often from very diverse uh, backgrounds, how important to them the sense that this is a genuinely inclusive culture, that it's one that will not only welcome them, but value the, the range of experiences that they will bring, the different life experiences, the different uh, 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 cultural backgrounds that they bring um, uh, to uh, the civil servant. It's, and it is absolutely critical to, for us uh, that we are able uh, to do that. We remain, it remains our ambition to be the country's most inclusive employer by 2020. The uh, Bronwyn said I would mention fusion. This is, um, in, some, in one sense, um, old wine in a new bottle, although I don't usually say that because I think it's a really cool thing that we're doing. Um, but essentially, what we're seeking to do, and it relates to that point I was making about the kind of commitments that governments make, not necessarily relating um, uh, naturally to the, to the departmental structure. Um, if you think about... Um, the big issues that, uh, that governments tend to and, and parties uh, uh, in elections tend to focus on. Obviously, uh, there's Brexit and all of the no-deal planning that we've been doing and deal planning that we've been doing over the past few months. But if there's 
if there's an agenda on competitiveness or an agenda on knife crime and violence or an agenda on supporting people with complex needs or troubled families, none of those issues neatly fit into the portfolio of one department. They all require multiple interventions by many departments. And in particular, if, as I hope we can do better and better, we're investing in prevention and early intervention as well as response and dealing with the consequences uh, of uh, problems that arise, um, then that in particular really does require different departments and indeed different parts of the uh, government community uh, to work together. So, for example, on knife crime, which, as you will know, the Prime Minister launched a new initiative on with, um, with a seminar just a few weeks ago involving uh, metropolitan mayors and stakeholders and police constables and, and others from right, uh, police chief constables, sorry, from right across, uh, uh, right across the country. Um, if we're going to address that issue, we need not only a law enforcement and criminal justice response, we need a social policy response that involves education, uh, involves uh, the digital uh, sector, uh, uh, and involves um, uh, all the other social actors. And we have to bring all of those capabilities together around a core government uh, programme, which of course is one uh, that uh, all uh, political parties uh, want to see uh, addressed. There is something that we have learned that um, when there's a crisis, whether it's a crisis um, uh, of the kind that uh, uh, we faced, uh, uh, we faced whether it's a national security uh, issue or a major environmental problem like a flood, uh, the um, uh, uh, um, uh, fuel uh, protests back in 2001, or even something, uh, the, uh, uh, the tragedy uh, like uh, the Grenfell Tower fire, which of, course, of which of course it was the anniversary just this week. All of the institutional boundaries and jealousies uh, fall away. People rally around. People recognize that they're team players and think of themselves as public servants uh, first. Uh, politicians, uh, local and national, civil servants, local and national, uh, police officers, the military, whoever, all just work together um, in a common uh, endeavor. And it's really trying to take that sort of practice, which we are absolutely superb at when we're facing a crisis, and say, how do we apply those lessons to the normal priorities, to the big priorities of our governments and uh, of our citizens? Um, we've based the approach, the fusion approach, on previous uh, attempts at this. It isn't new, and indeed we've drawn the lessons from them. Think back to uh, the Labour governments, Gordon Brown's uh, cross-cutting public service agreement targets. There was a great deal of uh, uh, lessons that we can learn from that. And, of course, as I've said, from the COBRA uh, mechanisms that we apply uh, to different, uh, to different uh, 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 crises and issues as they arrive. So what we've tried to do with Fusion is bring together essentially three components. It isn't just collaboration in the traditional Whitehall style, where essentially people get around a table, you hammer out a compromise, and sometimes, not always to be fair, but sometimes it can end up being the lowest common denominator. The idea is actually to start with the goals that ministers have set uh, and work through to what the catalytic intervention can be of government. And the point about a catalytic intervention is, again, really important if we look at the public service of the future. We are not, in government, simply going to be able to legislate, regulate, or operate to deal with uh, most of the challenges that we face and most of the expectations of our citizens. We have to work with partners between central and local, uh, uh, national government and local government. We have to work with the third sector. We have to work with the private sector. Uh, and we have to work with the individual citizen. One of the most important innovations Jeremy Hayward introduced when he uh, was in this job was the behavioral insight work and really trying to understand how David Halpern's here, how through nudge techniques and being really thoughtful about our interventions, can we catalyze, influence uh, the behavior of uh, citizens and institutions uh, to achieve our policy uh, objectives. So there's a strategic planning framework is the first part of it. And that, as I say, takes the ministerial priorities and tries to turn them into plans and catalytic, catalytic interventions. The second component is an implementation mechanism, cross-government, to deliver the decisions that have been uh, taken. That brings together senior officials under uh, the Cabinet Committee structure um, in implementation groups, uh, essentially topic by topic, issue by issue. Now, that's not every single thing that government does. Otherwise, we just create a whole new set of structures across those that already, um, uh, already exist. But it is uh, designed to, uh, uh, to deliver the big priorities uh, across uh, the government uh, system. And the third component is capabilities. 
thinking about how do we deploy in the short term the full range of government and non-government, national capabilities that are available to us, and the longer term, what development do we need in those to meet the, uh, meet the needs uh, of the future and create the right feedback mechanisms so that we can learn uh, as we go. And the priorities obviously will change according to the needs of the time, the needs of the citizen, and the priorities uh, of the government. As I said, it draws on uh, previous models. We developed it in the national security arena when I was the national security advisor there, um, and we're gradually now trying to extend it across some of the key areas, other areas of policy, because we think there are genuine lessons that we can learn from that kind of strategic uh, framework. So as we do so, what we're trying to do is help ministers um, as they wrestle with um, uh, the, all of the priorities and all of, of the financial and other constraints that all governments face to really understand the impact and the collective impact of individual policies, um, first order impact and second order impact on the citizen, on the community and on the country as a whole. All governments will uh, uh, want to uh, improve our prosperity. All governments will want to uh, uh, care for our security and safety. All governments care about uh, our global influence. All governments care about sustainability. Uh, all governments uh, want inclusive communities and citizens and care about the well-being uh, of the citizen. And our role is to try and help orchestrate the entire system, governmental and beyond government, uh, in order to try and achieve uh, those goals, whether it's at local level, at national level, or at uh, global level. Final point I'd make is this. I was uh, involved in the, uh, the big events last week, the state visit of President Trump, uh, and then uh, the D-Day uh, celebrations, the D-Day commemoration for D-Day uh, 75. And it was just a reminder, listening to the Queen talk about uh, the common national endeavour and the sort of spirit uh, of, uh, those, uh, uh, of those times, that actually when we really do work together, we can achieve uh, extraordinary uh, things. And uh, it's, uh, uh, w the challenges we face now are nothing like that, and uh, uh, we're looking ahead to a much more complex set of challenges and opportunities over the next decade. Uh, but uh, uh, our job is to ensure that the civil and the wider public service is in shape not just to deliver uh, the needs of the government of the day, but to ensure that we are gradually building the capabilities that can help that government and future governments uh, address their priorities, the challenges, uh, the opportunities ahead. And as I said at the beginning, uh, it's an enormous privilege to be the head of the civil service and to be at the heart uh, of the public service uh, in this job. Uh, and uh, what I've set out are some of the ideas that we're now pursuing collectively uh, with our public service leadership colleagues uh, as a whole uh, to try and ensure that we really are as a public service and a civil service, uh, deserving of that place at the top of the Insize Index, that we'll stay there, uh, and that we're able, more importantly, to deliver for the governments and the citizens that we serve. Thank you very much. So, Mark, thank you very much indeed, uh, taking us right through. As you said, as I asked you to, the challenges uh, of running the civil service and of what the civil service is doing at the moment. Let me start with the most uh, practical question uh, of all, um, whether you've got enough people. We, 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 we count them here, uh, and uh, not all of them in the audience, um, and have noticed that uh, the numbers have gone up by 10,000 uh, since Brexit burst onto the scene. Um, are you going to need more people still? I think, we'll need, uh, I think the needs in terms of people will change. We have needed more people to uh, work on Brexit because obviously it's a very complex uh, set of challenges and we've needed to bring in particular uh, skill sets. So um, I think the legal profession in government has, um, has done pretty well uh, out of this. Uh, we've, we've, been, uh, we've needed uh, more people with legal expertise, for example. But if I look ahead and look over the longer term, I think uh, we're always going to need to keep changing the blend uh, of our staff. So I mentioned um, the, uh, the services to the citizen and the impact of new technology. If you look, I was at a, uh, an office, uh, a Job Centre Plus office in Newcastle a few, uh, a few months ago, and they were telling me about how, how their work has changed. Um, not least because employment rates are now high, much of their work uh, is, tr is, is focused on people with complex needs uh, and trying to find them productive routes into uh, employment, which of course is good for them and, uh, and good for the, uh, for the overall uh, position. And because there's n partly because there's new technology and partly because, therefore, uh, people who are simply moving jobs in the traditional way can you know, look online and it, it, it's essentially a matching kind of service, uh, those 
uh, civil servants working in that job centre no longer need to do that work for them because they can, people can do it for themselves. They can self-serve uh, online. That means they can focus more of their attention on the people with complex needs. And so the nature of their work is changing. It's becoming more akin to essentially social work. Uh, and they are, the training that they require to be able to deal with those people is also changing. There's a premium on empathy and emotional intelligence as opposed to simply processing uh, in the way that probably their predecessors would 25 years ago. So whether we'll need more uh, or fewer people So those civil ahead, service jobs at least are not going to robots? So those, those civil service, because they can't, because robots yeah. don't do empathy. Um, uh, at least uh, uh, not uh, in my lifetime, I hope. Um, but, but so the nature of the work is changing. Um, but what it does mean is we can wrap a more intensive intervention around some of those people than would probably have been the case in the past. So what exactly that will mean for overall numbers, I don't know. But I do know that the nature of the work will change, although we will have more and more civil servants um, uh, essentially putting a premium on their, uh, 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 on their capabilities as human beings rather than human resources. And I think that's a, that means there are, more, uh, there are richer jobs and, uh, 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 and some, and some uh, great opportunities. Thank you. We can't avoid the question of Brexit, which is sitting there like a great boulder in the way of all kinds of other things uh, we and the government might be, might be talking about and, and, and doing. Uh, people ask you regularly, um, is the UK prepared for no deal? And you're kind enough sometimes to tackle this question. What would your current answer be? Um, we did a lot of preparation for no deal in the run-up to the March-April uh, deadline. And of course, we continue to try and keep those... Uh, uh, those programs uh, in the best uh, possible shape. But a lot of this depends on the choices made by the private sector and by third parties. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to, to do that work. Actually, I think we were in pretty good shape. I mean, there are, you know, it, it's inevitable that uh, uh, any change of that uh, kind will have, uh, will have consequences. But we are, I, think, I think we had the government in, in pretty good shape and the public service in pretty good shape for it. Uh, and we try to continue to ensure that that's the case. Are we, uh, is the private sector in as good shape as it was in March? We heard all this about the stockpiling and then the running down of stocks, and I wondered in your conversations with business how, you th you know, how they were thinking they should now plan and what kind of advice you were giving them. I think it varies across uh, the economy, but uh, uh, different, and different sectors are preparing in, in different ways. Uh, we put out a great deal of technical information, actually, uh, just under a year ago. We've continued to interact with business. I think we've, different departments have got a greater, who, who interact with different sectors, have greatly improved their understanding of the requirements of those sectors, uh, the concerns they have about uh, uh, what, uh, what the consequences and the impact uh, might be. Um, and, and so the dialogue, the dialogue continues. And I think it, one would have to say that the, the preparedness across the economy varies from sector to sector. And obviously it depends business to business on how exposed they are to trade with the EU, uh, whether they're operating domestically, etc. Um, but uh, uh, the, the programme of interaction, I think, mm. is, in, is, uh, uh, is in good shape and continues. You mentioned needing more lawyers, and we have, uh, like many others, noticed... I was teasing uh, slightly. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not, uh, because um, we noticed uh, here at the I'm seeing some nods from one or two lawyers in the audience the whole who whole of them. Uh, We um, notice how many of these questions about... Brexit turned very quickly into constitutional questions. And I wondered what kind of work you were doing, for example, on the integrity of the Union, um, because questions of Scottish independence and Northern Ireland um, uh, border poll are suddenly a staple of conversation in a way that they, they weren't. Uh, they are. I mean, of course, part of our job is to support, uh, and part of my job mm -hmm. is to support the government of the day in... Uh, thinking through all of the constitutional and other issues of that, uh, uh, of that kind uh, in all consequences, in, in all circumstances. You'll understand I don't want to comment on that, mm. uh, particularly, I mean, I think it would be appropriate for a cabinet secretary to be drawn public on those mm. issues uh, at any time, but we'd be particularly sensitive now. But of course, we ensure that governments have all the advice that we can, legal advice, constitutional advice, policy advice that they need. Mm. Is it a, a real possibility that the monarch might be drawn into some of these things? There's often I mean, there's an enormous amount, obviously, of press commentary on all these things, and there comes a point quite regularly where they say, um, and even in a slightly titillating way, and even the, que the Queen might be drawn in to settle a question, for example, of whether Parliament could be prorogued um, or what would happen after um, uh, a vote of no confidence or so on. And quite often the Cabinet Secretary is then invoked as the person who might have to 
make this decision? Does it feel to you whether, that that is um, actually a real possibility or is this overblown? Um, well, I, I, again, I don't want to comment on a political question. Mm. Uh, let me just make two points. First, the Cabinet Secretary is never going to be the person who makes the decision. It, mm. The Cabinet Secretary may, is, is probably the person who provides the advice to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, but in the end, the politicians uh, and ministers make uh, the decisions. And of course, you're absolutely right to point to one of our core constitutional principles is the neutrality of the sovereign, and um, uh, everyone's very cognizant of, that, of the importance of maintaining that principle. We turn to what would be more conventional things if Brexit weren't sitting there. Um, if, if Brexit weren't there, we might be in a spending review at the moment. Is there going to be a spending review? Well, the, uh, uh, the current government, of course, yeah. has planned for a spending review yeah. this year. Obviously, we'll have a new uh, government at some point in uh, the near mm. future, and they will need to make their own uh, decisions about that. The current spending review um, uh, um, budgets essentially expire at the end of this financial year, so there will need to be decisions at least about next year. Uh, but, of course, it will be for a new Prime Minister, a new Chancellor to judge whether they want to do a full spending review or, um, uh, or something, uh, something more limited, and that will be a judgment for them as they, as they come in. <laughs> What do you say to your, your, your sort of saying, we, we are in a time that has put a lot of pressure on it, and people have talked a lot about what Brexit has done to the independence of the, the civil service. We are fierce defenders of a, a neutral uh, and independent civil service here, I, I, should, I should say. Do you feel that this is something um, that is under challenge and that you are having to defend? There have been some challenges to it, and of course you know I, I uh, took the unusual step of uh, writing publicly uh, about that, yeah. particularly some of the challenges to individuals. I'm very grateful that other institutions, the IFG notably, but others too, uh, the House of Commons uh, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee uh, have uh, also defended that principle robustly. It is, uh, again, an important constitutional principle. It's something I'm very proud of. I think it's a, there are many civil servants here. That's what we signed up for. Um, and as I said in uh, that letter I wrote, we, there is a contract here. We've always trusted that, that our fellow citizens know that we will serve completely impartially the governments they elect. Uh, and that must remain a core principle of the British, uh, uh, the British public service. It has been for, well, the better part of two centuries now, and, uh, and I hope it will continue for at least as long. Thanks very much in, indeed. Let's, I, I know there's people who want to discuss quite a lot of different things. Let me, let me bring in a few questions now. I have not run out of things, just in case we... Um, okay, let's uh, uh, take the first, first one here. If you could uh, wait for the microphone and just say for the record uh, who you are, please. Um, Libby Wiener, ITV News. I know that you've touched on this, but is uh, the civil service ready for a no-deal Brexit in October? And secondly, do you personally get fed up with all the attacks from politicians that uh, you're facing in relation to your um, impartiality regarding Brexit? Um, I, I don't imagine any uh, body in my job, um, none of you, you don't go into the civil service um, to find yourself in the newspapers. Uh, so you know, it's never a comfortable place to be if you're in my job or if you're, in a, if you're a senior civil servant uh, for whatever reason. Um, and I'm rather hoping that I've been so dry that I'm not in them <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, 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 but we'll, uh, we'll, have to, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, look, I think it is, it is important that politicians as a whole remember that the civil service is impartial. We are there to serve the government of the day uh, and future governments that the electorate elect. And of course, uh, uh, I, you know, I would much rather that wasn't a matter uh, of, uh, of controversy. We genuinely do serve the government of the day and we provide them with the best possible advice. Candid advice in private, but of course um, we then uh, take the decisions uh, that they make and do our level best to implement them once those decisions uh, are made. And that's, uh, that's the way it's always, uh, it's always proceeded. Um, uh, and you know, I hope that we can continue in that vein. Well, I, I, as I said to Bromwood, I think we did a, we did a great... I mean, uh, the, the, one of the most uh, impressive pieces of cross-government work uh, 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 that I've uh, experienced over the past... I mean, in my career, but certainly uh, uh, recently, is the effort a cross-government we made to, do, to make no-deal preparations. Those preparations uh, uh, continue, uh, and we will be in the best possible shape we can for whatever, uh, whatever happens. Thanks. There's one right at the back. Um, Matthew Dancona, Tortoise Media. Uh, Smart, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. And the fact you're here illustrates, I suppose, part of the, 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 um, one of the tensions in your role, which is that you are, by your very nature of your office, 
issuing confidential advice that remains confidential, but you're also increasingly, um, the Cabinet Secretary is a public figure, and you're also a National Security Advisor. And in the NSC case, you were, you were a very public figure and uh, drawn into uh, what became a political debate. I'm not expecting you to comment on the political debate, but what did that episode teach you about the, 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 the exercise of leak inquiries and how to behave when your, your own integrity is, is impugned immediately afterwards? Um, I mean, clearly, that wasn't a, a comfortable uh, position, but the leak inquiry was conducted by professional investigators within uh, the government uh, security group and overseen by our propriety and ethics team. Uh, and I'm very confident in the work uh, that, they, uh, uh, that they did. Of course, it wasn't a comfortable, it wasn't a comfortable period for anyone uh, involved. Um, but I think you have to conduct these, uh, these uh, inquiries with integrity. Uh, it was a serious, uh, a serious matter. And the Prime Minister reached the conclusion uh, that, she, that she did on the basis of the evidence that the professional investigators uh, provided. And I think that's the only way to proceed. You have to play it by the book. Um, okay, I, I, right, in the middle. And then I'm coming over here. Um, Sam Coates, Sky News. Um, Sir Mark, can I just press you a bit on no deal on October the 31st? Um, you say you're prepared. Um, what level of disruption, you've seen all the plans, what level of disruption might the public anticipate at that point? And what, from a civil service point of view, would, no, would success look like for a no-deal Brexit on October the 31st? Well, again, I don't think, it's, I don't think particularly right now it's right, it's right for me as the Cabinet Secretary to comment on that. That's the kind of question that ministers traditionally answer, and they answer it in Parliament, and of course there have been many, many, many statements about it. So you'll understand I don't want to get drawn into what is essentially a... Um, uh, a political and public issue for ministers. All I will say is that the civil service did a, uh, a great deal of work to prepare for no deal, uh, the contingency of no deal back in the spring. We keep those preparations uh, in hand and we're ready to support whatever decisions uh, ministers make as we run up towards uh, the 31st of October. Thanks. Over here. Uh, thank you. Valerie Amos, I'm not a journalist. I'm on the board of the IFG. Um, I wanted to bring you back to your comments about um, people and uh, the public service. And you made a comment about the importance of, as it were, the cultural competence of uh, civil servants. And I wondered if you could say a bit more about the how, um, in the context of the changes that are happening in the world, and the fact that it is not just the traditional departments that deal with overseas, the Foreign Office, uh, yeah. uh, DFID, um, uh, Defence, that have to understand how to negotiate that world. How, the, how you're thinking about that cultural competence in terms of creating uh, the competencies of a public service that is now global and having to negotiate a range of global uh, issues. How do you improve the skill base in terms of negotiating that wider world? It's a, uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Of course, you know, you know much about this from your own experience uh, in government. Um, when, we, when we had the civil service leadership together today, uh, we deliberately timed this to coincide with the Foreign Office Leadership Conference when they had many of their senior, actually most of their senior ambassadors back from overseas, and several of them were there. And that was, again, really the first time we'd done that, because I want to try and create that sense of a, of a united public service that is global as well as national and, uh, uh, and local. And uh, uh, we're seeing more uh, civil servants from the home civil service doing jobs overseas. I want to uh, encourage more of that. I also want to see more people with my background, I'm a diplomat by background, uh, working in the domestic civil service and actually remembering uh, and understanding um, the issues that preoccupy uh, governments and, uh, and our own citizens. But there are things, other things we can, uh, we can do. That's, that's already, I think, changed quite a lot over the last 25 years. There's more and more uh, of that uh, interaction. Uh, and, and many uh, posts, uh, when I was an ambassador, I think I had 12 government departments there. I think that's quite common now in the big posts. Washington probably has uh, uh, even uh, more than that. Beijing does. I took a group of permanent secretaries recently with me on a trip to Beijing. Part of that was to do quite a lot of business, but part of it was to just familiarize people with a country very few people um, uh, uh, understand, uh, uh, understand well or have had much uh, interaction with. 
But part of this is also just some more um, obvious things, like uh, exposing more people within the civil service to the opportunity for language training. Because as you know, if you do language training, you don't just learn the language, you learn a great deal about the culture uh, that that language uh, represents. I, I learned Arabic, uh, and I learned an enormous about, about the culture of uh, uh, those uh, countries, both from serving in them, but just from understanding the development of the, uh, of the language uh, as well. So uh, we're looking at that as we, uh, uh, as we think about the kind of training that we give people in the future. And of course, it's part of what's going to make us attractive as an employer to a mobile um, and uh, sort of global, globally uh, focused um, uh, cohort of people coming out of uh, education who want the opportunity to work overseas and uh, experience a wider range of cultures uh, and so on. So I think it's going to be an ongoing program of training, familiarization, retraining uh, throughout people's careers. We've got time for probably a couple more. I think there's one hand over here and I'm, I'm okay, I'll come over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Matthew Hall has some a journalist from MLEX. I wondered if I could ask you a question in your national security capacity. Um, I wonder, has, has your assessment of Huawei and 5G shifted at all in, in recent weeks, particularly in light of the President Trump's visit? Um, and how long should industry be waiting uh, for clarity uh, on the, the outcome of the telecom supply chain review? Thank you. Well, again, it's a decision for ministers. Uh, and uh, as I think uh, several have said, decision not, has not yet uh, been taken. But obviously, we're looking at all of the issues, the technical security issues, the uh, industrial policy issues, the strategic issues, and so on, and ministers will take uh, a, a decision. They're, they're clearly aware of the, uh, the context within which they're taking it, including the time the ministers will take a decision uh, in due course. It's one for them, not for me. Over here at the, by the door, behind the door. Thank you. Sue Street, a former permanent secretary. Um, really Sue. interesting, but I understand that you have to be careful in what you say. You've talked about empathy, and I just wanted to understand a little bit more about you, your personal style, and how really, as civil servants look up to ministers and fail to get purpose and direction, you provide it. <laughs> I quite like the first half of the question. <laughs> uh, by the way, I don't think they do. I, don't think, I mean, I genuinely don't think that's, that's a, a fair characterization, really. So, I mean, I understand why you make it, but I don't think it's a fair characterization at all. Um, uh, I mean, our job is to take the direction we get from ministers and turn it into uh, programs to implement the, uh, the, the priorities that they set out. And, of course, as I said earlier, that in, that in a modern society involves a much more complex set of interventions that would have been the case 20, 30, uh, 40 years ago, and a wider range of partnerships. And that's, that's our job. I think what I hope I bring, I mean, in a sense, uh, 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 there will be people here who've probably participated and given me some 360 feedback, so maybe you should ask some of them. But I think what I bring is that determination always to take that wider perspective and to try and ensure that the civil and public service are thinking, uh, 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 are thinking ahead so that we can help governments um, uh, uh, not just react, but prepare for the kind of challenges that, uh, and opportunities the country faces and operate more broadly. I've, because I've had a career that's been, um, uh, as Valerie Amos was just uh, indicating, uh, overseas and, and quite sort of global in its uh, nature, and there are other people with that background here, Lord Kerr, uh, one of my uh, uh, old bosses who's given me the look he used to give me when I was a very junior uh, uh, diplomat uh, working, uh, working for him. I think one of the things I can bring is that instinctive, outward-looking perspective. Uh, and that is something Whitehall needs to get better at. We need to remember we don't sit at the top of a system, we sit at the centre of a system, and uh, we've got to look out through that system, out to the citizen uh, and, the, uh, and the people we serve. And I think one instinctively thinks that way uh, with my background, and I hope that's what I can bring to it. Okay, thanks. I, I'm going to take uh, two, two more. Will you forgive me and not and ask you one more myself? But then I think we have to stop uh, here on the aisle and then and then here. Uh, so, Mark, I just wondered if could, you could you say who you are, please? Uh, Jessica Parker, BBC News. Uh, there are reports that you've had meetings or discussions with uh, Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt, two of the leadership candidates. I just wondered if you can f confirm whether that's true and what could be potentially read into that. Um, so uh, we will have access talks, just as we would, I mean, not just as we would, but, but uh, sort of similarly to as we were doing a, during a general election with the last two candidates once the 
parliamentary process has honed it down to the last two. And that's in order to ensure that we are ready to give them the best possible start, whoever is elected, once they um, uh, become uh, party leader and then uh, uh, on the presumption they become prime minister shortly after that. And that's to talk to them about how they want to run number 10, what their policy priorities are, uh, what, you know, what, uh, whether there are any other changes they uh, want to make. Those I have not had access talks with anyone so far. Some of that stuff has been overwritten. Of course, in my job, you talk to senior politicians quite a lot. I guess I'll be talking to some uh, in the uh, event uh, that, uh, that follows this. And we've also provided, as you would expect, guidance to cabinet ministers who are engaged in the leadership contest because of all the usual rules around um, SPADs and, uh, and so on. But that, that's just a, a, completely, uh, a completely routine matter in, a, uh, in, in something of this kind. Um, Andrew Kahn, a governor here at the Institute. Thank you very much for your talk, uh, Sir Mark. I was struck during our conference how the issues that the civil service faces now are not new issues. Uh, performance measurement might be just one of them. And indeed, I, I go back to when I was principal private secretary for the uh, civil service minister with William Waldegrave in the 1990s. We did a civil service reform paper which really addresses just the same issues. Would you like to reflect how far, and indeed the conference also looked at countries overseas, and they are facing the same sort of issues. Would you like to reflect just how far the civil service in Britain today is confronting the same old issues that the civil service has confronted during your entire career, and how much are there some new, different challenges for the civil service, which a new era needs a different type of civil service? I think it's both. I mean, I think it's both. We've, you, government has always wrestled with this question of how to ensure that the, as what one might describe the horizontal connective tissue uh, is as strong or is as strong as the vertical structures that you have in departments or indeed in all big organisations. Uh, and of course you have to have boundaries. Uh, you can move, put them in different places. The question is are they barriers or interfaces? And governments have always, uh, uh, and, and the civil service has always uh, wrestled with that. And what we're doing, uh, I think we've improved. I think it's become a great deal better over my career. If I look at uh, certain uh, uh, areas uh, of activity, uh, it, there's a much more natural uh, sort of collaboration between departments and between civil servants than was the case in the past. Most civil and public servants are team players. Uh, if you aren't, it isn't a great choice of, uh, of career. Go, you know, there are other, uh, other uh, uh, career paths one can pursue. So actually, a lot of this it's not about changing the culture of the individuals. They are team players, and given the opportunity, they rally around a particular issue. Um, it's removing some of the structural barriers uh, to, them, uh, to them doing that. And as I said, the fusion approach that we're taking is building on previous, uh, previous efforts of this, all of which have moved uh, the agenda forward. I guess the point I'd say, Andrew, in, in, sort of res in, in, in response to the sort of second part of your, uh, of your question, is how important is that in the era that we now face, in the 2020s? And my own view, uh, and I think this is shared across the civil service leadership, is that it is even more important than ever. It's always been important to try and help deliver the priorities of governments. But we're now moving into an era where the challenges are coming thick and fast. Countries that really respond well to those challenges will prosper, and those that don't will fall behind. And so it is critically important that the civil and public service are absolutely the top of our game, and those uh, uh, things that might have been regarded as discretionary in the past, actually, in terms of working together and working effectively and implementing many of the reforms that this institution and others have pursued, are not going to be discretionary in the future if we're to uh, support governments and support citizens in the way they need. Thank you. Let me just ask you finally, that you touched on your diplomatic past um, and you know the Foreign Office very well. And I'm asking this because we're doing a piece of work on exactly this at the Institute at the moment, which is really about how the UK should think of uh, going about influencing the EU, assuming that we leave and we become, as the EU puts it, a third country. Um, do we need more diplomats? Should we do things differently? How, how would you encourage the civil service, I'm talking about, you know, to, to, to go about the business of influencing the EU? Well, um, I don't know whether we'll need more. Uh, we have an awful lot of people with a great deal of experience of working within the EU, uh, of course, including many people in wide areas of domestic uh, policy, because hitherto, uh, the, the EU, of course, uh, has been a very important factor uh, uh, in, in that, and there are many areas of national life subject to EU regulations and so on, and people will need to bring that experience back into the domestic uh, environment as we um, uh, 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 take, take control of uh, our own regulatory environment, uh, for example. Um, we're pretty good at in influencing institutions um, uh, from 
uh, the outside. Uh, we have a lot of existing relationships, people with great deal of expertise. Of course, it will be different. You said, will it be different? Of course, it will be different. We'll be a third country. We won't be sitting in European councils. Uh, so we will have to uh, operate in a different way, um, uh, as other countries do, to try and ensure that the decisions that are being taken there, just as the decisions that are taken in Washington and Beijing and uh, other places, um, reflect, and as, and as far as possible, are influenced by our national interests. Actually, our Foreign Office and our diplomatic service do a fantastic job of that around the world, and I think we'll be applying to the European environment many of the approaches that we have generally applied elsewhere, and as I said, I think we're pretty good at it. Thank you. I think on that note, we are um, going to uh, end, uh, just to give a few minutes break before the party really kicks off. Um, <laughs> And you get a, you, you will get you will get a uh, head, you'll get a head start was on, that, was that on all the feedback? other <laughs> on all the uh, on all the other guests who are, who are coming um, and uh, for, for those of you staying for at least a part of the party uh, David Sainsbury's and my final final remarks of this tenth anniversary celebration will be just a, a touch before seven o'clock um, but before that, that, that is a good hour in the future uh, could you. Join me in thanking Mark Sedwell, who's been immensely frank and willing to come and talk at these enormously sensitive times with a lot of moving pieces and a lot of sensitive pieces. And we really appreciate you coming today to come and talk as much as you can about the, uh, the future of the civil service. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you, you all for coming.